I'm Connor Happer, and I'm here to tell you the most important game in the first seven for Nebraska, but it might not be the one you think it is. Next. You are Locked On Nebraska, your daily Nebraska Cornhuskers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, good morning, and thanks for making Locked On Nebraska your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as we wind down and get past the all-star break in baseball. The sports kind of stop sporting like we want them to, but this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a bonus or a boost daily. That is right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Head to FanDuel.com to get started. Welcome in. It is Wednesday. I am Mitch Sherman. Connor Happer is with me. And Connor, as you said in the cold open, you've got to take this week that Nebraska has a huge swing game when it comes to these first seven on the schedule that all appear winnable. Uh, tell me what this has to do with Bill Connolly's Big Ten preview that published this week on ESPN. And I went through and read every word of this afternoon or yesterday afternoon when you uh, you pointed me in that direction. What What is going on with the swing game conversation? You know, I can't, I, I wish I could go back in my brain and, and remember how I, how I connected to, the the story from Bill with this with this idea he he did have a good review of Rutgers and a preview of Rutgers for the year and um they it went Rutgers they, they, yeah Rutgers was the team sorry spoiler alert they went uh, they went I mean they went seven and six last year they won a bowl game um, I just think like we, we we focus on the we focus on the Colorado game it's a big game there's no doubt about it. I'm not I'm not diminishing the importance of that one but I think Rutgers is good like I, I and I think that's, you know, that's a team where when you get rid of divisions in the league, it it kind of benefits them quite a bit, you know, thinking about what they're what they're going to be like this year. And then, you know, they don't have to play Ohio yeah. State and Penn State every single in Michigan every single year. They don't play any of those teams this year. In fact, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, they do. They do play USC, UCLA. um, but they have a they have a pretty light schedule. They go to Virginia Tech in the non con. That 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 doesn't matter in the context of how good they're going to be. But I, I think that's going to be a pretty good team. And I think Nebraska has got a um, an interesting road to potentially seven zero, which people have been talking about. That is the biggest roadblock to me because I think that's the best team. Okay, that is quite a take. And I'm not saying that you're wrong. I think Colorado might be better than Rutgers when Nebraska plays Colorado in week two before the buffs hit hit the uh hit a speed bump somewhere along the way early in the big 12 probably but um week two i expect the buffs to be formidable um i expect rutgers to be formidable on october 5th i expect purdue to be formidable for nebraska on september 28th because it's the first road game of the year heck how about illinois coming in on september 20th that's potential for a uh um, little payback from the Friday night last year in Champaign. So there are a lot of difficult, difficult games, difficult in the sense of like not being on par with Ohio state, but difficult still for a Nebraska team. That's trying to find its footing on the, in the college football world. Well, I mean, so maybe this is what we're getting into then. I and mean, we we've, this has been a talking point all off season long, looking at the schedule and just the way it breaks down. Maybe we should, maybe we should go with this then what's the, What's the worst record you could see Nebraska with heading into October 26 against Ohio State? And then I think we both agree that the best is 7-0. And and it is on the table. Excuse me, it is on the table. But you just mentioned it. You know, nothing's easy. Nebraska lives in this middle area of college football where, um, you know, the margin for error is is really, really thin. And Colorado is going to be a huge game. And and Illinois on a Friday night is different and weird. You go to Purdue, you go to Indiana with a first year head coach and you play a pretty good Rutgers team. So, um, you know, I'm giving them Northern Iowa and UTEP, but that's about it. What if I told you, I think Nebraska will be no worse than three and four going to going to Ohio <laughs> state. On October 26. <laughs> that's encouraging on one hand and very discouraging on the other hand. It doesn't sound that. great. Does it? But I'm saying yeah. this is worst case scenario. Like they're going to win against UTEP in Northern Iowa. And I do not think they're going to go 0-5 the rest of the way. I'm still, 
I, I just I just don't see any way. I mean, you can talk about all the injuries you want. They will find a way to win one game minimum out of those five against conference foes and the buffs. Yeah. And 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 we both agree that they could at least, at least maybe all five. They could win all five. They could win all five. So we we both agree that they could reasonably go seven zero. So all the seven zero talk sounds like pie in the sky stuff, but maybe you know it doesn't sound that crazy to me beating uh, UTEP, Colorado, Northern Iowa, Illinois, Purdue, Rutgers, and Indiana. Now the scary part is, of course, beating all of them in a row. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's that's a thing. But like, so I was looking at maybe this is the connecting piece to Bill Connolly's rankings. Um, in his uh, preseason SP Plus projections, I think he'll do another update on this before the season starts. Um, but they are, they do have the best Rutgers as the best ranking out of any of those teams. Now, that doesn't do include uh, road games. Obviously, you you know, you get dinged a little bit if you're matching the two teams up. So maybe a game against Indiana will technically be a tougher or a shorter spread or whatever it might be. Same thing with that Purdue. But Rutgers, according to the just bare rankings of the SP Plus, um, comes in as the best team that Nebraska will play in in that first set of games. And I think they were at in the in the upper forties. Let me check on them real quick. But uh, I, while you're while you're doing 49, that, forty nine, forty nine. Okay, I don't even know how we will. I don't even know if we'll be able to say after these seven games what the potential swing game was. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you need to see an entire season and and break it down and get some separation from it before you know what a swing game was. Like, what was the swing game for Nebraska in 2023? I, I'm not sure. If if things had gone <laughs> had differently, yeah, if things had gone differently and they had had a good November, you would definitely look at Illinois the week after Michigan. But I, I mean, was there a swing game? There doesn't have to be a swing game, but but poten- the potential for it is there with several of these of these early season games. Colorado's not really a swing game because it's just too early on the on the on the calendar. Uh, maybe um, if it, if it just launches like this stretch of outstanding play, and you swung from somehow like not 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 doing well against UTEP, but still winning. I'm going to say the game that I'm putting a lot of stock in, like just as a barometer for like how Nebraska plays the first half of the season will be reflected by game X. I'm going to say Illinois. And uh, Illinois to me has a history of being that game for Nebraska in recent years. And it was I, last I, year. I, yeah. And, and it really would have been last year if November had gone differently. But I, I think like the Friday night, it just presents a little bit something different, a little bit of a of a, just a quirk in the mindset. You know, you could it can work to your advantage. It might, it might not. Um, you know, I, I think the stadium is gonna be is gonna be juiced up pretty good as as much for that game as any in the in the in the early season run, ex- with the exception of September seventh against against Colorado. So that to me is the game that I'm looking at as. Uh, a tone setter, I suppose, is maybe better than than swing game. But you like you like Rutgers. You like homecoming on October fifth. Yeah, and 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 it's it probably wouldn't qualify. Now we're splitting hairs on all these things, but like um, it, it probably wouldn't qualify as like a tone setter or anything like that. I just think that's okay. um that's 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 a game. I mean, Nebraska's never lost to Rutgers before, so we could I guess we right. could throw in the history of of that part of it as well. It's a maybe it's a game where. Because of the two programs' histories, Nebraska is simply expected to win it. Um, it's a game you better not let sneak up on you, and and you know I don't I don't think they will. But you have a bye coming up right after that. Um, you know that that next weekend after October fifth, you're coming off the road game against Purdue. Maybe you get an emotional road win or something like that. It's just it's just a game you better not take lightly. That's all. If, and and it, that that would be I guess the thing. It's easier to go five and zero than it is to go seven and zero. Um, I will take a bow now for the the math Lovely. Um, wizardry. But if Nebraska's five and zero on October fourth, then that game becomes to me a real interesting and and potentially dangerous one because if if you start four and zero at home, okay, you've kind of held serve. It's very good, but there, you know Nebraska at that point might be like ranked 25th in the country is they're not it's not like they're going to be uh people around around the big 10 and and the nation um you know just 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 
at the feet of the Huskers, you know, saying welcome back to the big time. You know, it depends on how the games go, but I, I think it will be tempered enthusiasm if they manage to go four and zero. But five and zero with a win on the road at Purdue, I think, was when people would really start to pay attention to Nebraska. It's like, hey, they went five and zero. They just won a Big Ten road game. They're two and zero in the Big Ten. Probably back ranked. home. You got yeah, they're definitely ranked. You got Rutgers coming in, and then a bye week. Wow, this is setting up to be a special season for Matt Rule in year two. And then wham. Here comes Rutgers, and it's a dangerous, it's a trap game at that point. So that that to me would really, really add to the intrigue if they find a way to to, um, to win their first to win their first five. That's a good way to describe it, um, and I would agree with you. I would also something you said before uh, piqued my interest a little bit. I, I'm mildly interested in a non conference or a bowl game between Colorado and Rutgers. I think that sounds just astronomically fun. I I would I would love to watch that. The Big Ten, Big Twelve, they've got uh, nothing says Big Ten, Big Twelve like I guess you know Colorado and the Big Twelve isn't all that weird, but anyway, uh, that's tradition, tradition, postseason tradition right there. Rutgers, Colorado, <laughs> <clears throat> something else. <coughs> excuse me, from Connolly in his Big Ten preview. Might need you to take over here. Nebraska, number sixth ranked defense in the nation. Um, according to SP plus and one Oh four offensively. Yeah. That's, that's um, his projection for this year. Yeah. And you know, that's just because of what we don't, I think know about, about, well, Nebraska's offense in general, but obviously, obviously the quarterback and I know the quarterback piece is heavily factored into that equation. Nebraska's not going to have the 104th best offense in the country this year. I don't, I'm not going to tell you that they're going to have a good offense um, or a great offense, but I mean, it's it, it should be about middle of the road, and it definitely, definitely will not be as detrimental to their ability to win games as it was a year ago. So even with that, even with that combination, they still come in at, I believe it was straight up 40 overall in the yeah. uh, in the SP Plus projection. So, I mean, that's that, those aren't new. Like, those came out kind of post-spring, so maybe there's some things that kind of change as we get, go before the season. Then, obviously, they'll fluctuate big time in the first couple weeks of the season, but um, also, the, you know, another thing to note, one more thing to note from that, he does the, you know, percentage chance to do this percentage chance to win the conference, win 11 games and win six. So while he has Nebraska projected at 10th in the big 10 conference, that might sound bad. He gives him an 85%. The, the, the number of the metric gives him an 85% chance to win six games to go to a bowl game. It, it tells you a lot about those first seven games. And only uh, five other teams in the league are are better than that to get to get to more than six. That's not the goal, um, but it, it tells you a lot about Nebraska's schedule. Yeah. All right. Coming up after the break, we're going to get back to our countdown of the most important Huskers this year, and uh, we are just a week away from uh, from Big Ten Media Day. So a little bit of talk about that. Also, that's coming up next. All right, Happer here for the FanDuel Sportsbook. And uh, as you may know, I love sports. And I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But we head into one of the dullest days of the sports calendar today, tomorrow, before baseball starts back sad. up. And it is it is sad. But guess what? FanDuel is still here for you because they're hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. And there's always something out there. So think about a future. Um, think about what you might like coming up on Friday in Major League Baseball or whatever else might be on the board. Um, you know, there's international, international basketball, international soccer all over the place. So you got to you gotta peek around a little bit. It might not be right in front of you, but FanDuel's got you if you want to go searching. Once again, they're hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily, something for everyone every day all summer long. Head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. That is with FanDuel. They are an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, welcome back. Uh, we are getting closer and closer to Big Ten Media Days a week from today. Uh, Matt Rule will take the stage in Indianapolis a week from yesterday. Uh, the event. Oh, no, will... it's Wednesday. He's he's up Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in Indy. He's the middle day. I hope because I well, get there for Wednesday. Okay, good. Well, I was going to say the 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 event is six days. The event starts six days from today. Yes. So all my radio friends who are headed out, they're probably going to be there for three days. Um, I'm not going this year. It'll be the 
first time in a couple of years that I that I miss it. I'm you, as you can tell, I'm very broken up about this. Um, but yes, rule will take the stage a week from today. It's grueling. It's grueling. It's a long, long three days. Um, and maybe some people will just be there for one. Um, last year we've talked about this. His message was the they wanted to get the respect back. He said, "Quote." I want people to respect when they see that white helmet with that red N on it. I want our fans to respect us when they pay their money to come watch us play. And I want our opponents to respect us. And I want all college football to respect the way that Nebraska plays the game. He said the same, pretty much the same exact thing in every interview that he did. It's it's almost amazing the way he kind of had it rehearsed. So I mean, we, we've talked about what he might go after this year and what his um you know what the message might be and i imagine they're still on that course at least a little bit mitch yeah we'll uh we'll talk about where matt rule might be this week as he as he or last week as he as he started to dream up the message to it to just kind of formulate in his mind what he might want to say he's going to have some kind of a message when he comes out on the stage in indy that's just who he is and I'm not sure. I'm not sure where you go from that because it can't be the same thing as a year ago. So um, we'll get a little bit more into that in the next segment. But right now, we are going to continue our countdown of the players most important to Nebraska's success in 2024, also known as the top 10 list of players in 2024, regardless of position and experience, whose success would most likely impact Nebraska's opportunity to earn victories under second year coach Matt Rule. How's Good. That? Getting even better. Yeah. Getting even yeah. better day by you, day. You like I like that one. I, I think I think we're gonna stick with that the rest of the way. Put it on um put it on a poster, something yep. like that. And all right, so number 10 was Javen Wright. We got to him on Monday. We talked about Tristan Alvano, the kicker, on Tuesday and why he's important for Nebraska. Today, drum roll, the eighth most important player for Nebraska is Ben Scott. Ben Scott will be representing the Nebraska offense at Big Ten Media Days in Indianapolis a week from today. He is, of course, the center, the guy snapping the ball to Dylan Rayola, the anchor of that offensive line, if you will. I will say he may not be the only offensive lineman who is on this list, and that just tells you how important that position group is for Nebraska's success here in 2024. Well, and I think when we were kind of compiling this, I, the, the idea of why he came in, he's still an important one, obviously, to to the point that you just made. But um, the, the reason why he might be a little lower than a guy or two as we as we head down the list is because there actually is some depth at the interior sure. offensive line spot. And and so if Nebraska felt like, you know, if, if Ben Scott couldn't go a game, they would probably, you know, go with Justin Evans. Um, mm -hmm. and then mix some things around. So he has a little bit of protection in terms of depth. This is purely about how good and consistent he was last year. I mean, they always say that, you know, when you have an offensive lineman and you don't really notice him, he's probably doing a pretty good job. And that was basically the case all throughout last year for Ben Scott. I can't really recall that many, um, certainly that many mistakes or, or, or too many things that stood out from him. That's a good thing. He anchored that offensive line and it just kind of got better and better and better throughout the year. So he gets he, not only because of his play, but also we got to have a representative um, on the offensive line as well. And there'll be another one that ends up on this list and it underlines the importance of that position. But Scott's a, a good one to put up there for sure. I, I think in this transfer portal era, what we've seen at Nebraska in many of its biggest hits who've transferred in to Lincoln it is is like a one year and then done kind of thing. Either they've had one year of eligibility left, or in the case of like a Trey Palmer, it was one year and then off to the NFL. And we have Tommy Hill this year, who is in his, his third year in the program, but his second year of being someone who is counted on to fill an important spot. And then Ben Scott on the O line in the in the same role year two and. It's it, I, I think if you can find a transfer who can come in and be consistent and just do his job without, as you said, as an offensive lineman, getting a ton of notice, and then you're able to get him back for year two, which was certainly no guarantee for Nebraska. Ben Scott, you know, along with some of the others who we've probably spent more time talking about in this role, like Ty Robinson, um, Bryce Benhart, Isaac Gifford, 
Ben Scott is another guy who could have just said, I have accomplished what I want in college and I'm going to go try this thing in the NFL and, and see what, see what happens. He could have done that, but um, I think there is, there is some loyalty there. I think it, it, you know, on the part of, of Scott with, with Donovan Raiola um, and uh, with, with Matt rule and, and, he wants to run it back, you know, not somebody who was recruited in Nebraska out of high school, but uh, he's ready to give it to uh, give it everything for a second year. And that's maybe not what you would always expect for for someone uh, who came via the portal. But they got it with Scott and what it could lead to is another level of play for him. And that would be that would be tremendously significant for Dylan and the Nebraska run game. No doubt about it. I was I was thinking about um, guys who have transferred. I mean, the Nebraska got a lot of transfers on their roster. I'm tracking them. You know, I got. I don't know if my scholarship distribution is even close anymore. But um, you know, they got they got like 15 or so guys that have transferred in that are on the roster, and most of them are are seniors. Obviously, the guys who came in this year, um, like Banks and and Nair. You know, another guy that I thought of while you were talking about that who who transferred in and has been here for a couple of years and might have a little bit more to prove and probably has a decent argument to be on this list. Um, give me, give me, Brian Buscini. Okay. I, well, now, we did the kicker. We did the kicker. So I think to, in my mind that eliminated the possibility of doing the punt. And that's fair. And that's fair. But, but maybe we give an honorable mention shout out to Brian Buscini here because I think... Yeah, they, 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 Mr. Boom Sheeny, he needs to be a little bit more Boom Sheeny, you know, mm-hmm. he needs to, uh, boom a couple more this year. And there was, that was a problem last year for Nebraska. So there you go. I did not to take away too much of Ben Scott's, uh, Scott's, you know, shine here, but, um, you know, that's, that's another one that I would probably throw on the list. Great guy, Buscini, by the yeah. way. He wants to be a dentist, right? Or he is a dentist. <laughs> he might be a dentist. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but, uh, all right, well, he's married and, and, you know, just, just wired different for sure than, than the rest, uh, many on the rest of the team. It's like, I ran into, to Buscini at a, at a Husker basketball game this year. And, and it's just like, Oh, I ran in, like running into your, uh, your neighbor or something like that. So hey, how's the lawn very, looking pretty very good. Cool. <laughs> exactly. Very cool. So, all, all right, right, coming up after the break, we're going to get into, um, just a hodgepodge of, you know, somewhat representative of what's happening this week in sports, which unless you're a huge fan of the all-star game in major league baseball is not very much at all. So we've got uh, some musings about Nebraska football and things that have been happening on social media. Uh, That's next. But first, if you have been watching Fox sports or ESPN on your TV all day and had to turn down the volume with all that shouting, make the switch to locked on sports today. It's a free 24 seven sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports Today delivers can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. It's streaming 24-7 on YouTube or on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, right, welcome back. Oh, Oh, sorry. I think it's it's me. Um, I'll do it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Here we go. Final segment of the show on this Wednesday. So was perusing social media the other day and I saw a post Connor from your producer, Josh on your wonderful radio show on 1620, the zone. And he seemed to be up in arms because was he visiting Lincoln and saw the outside of the Osborne legacy complex or was this something that he just ripped straight off of uh, another photo and posted on his own? No, he took that picture. Um, yeah. He uh, he's taking a little staycation. Well, kind of staycation, I guess. They went down to Lincoln. His kid, uh, younger kid, like has this need to be in a hotel pool, and so they wanted oh, yeah. to make it very comfortable. Um, and he also wanted his his kids also into dinosaurs, so they wanted to go over to Morrill Hall. And I oh. told him. When he goes over there, you'll be right across the street from Nebraska's gigantic new facility and in, in, in football stadium. He's like, no way. Okay, I'll I'll go over there and I'll check in. And wouldn't you know it, he he shows up and Nebraska has a it's a glass front that is facing the the south side, um, right in that kind of 
welcoming area on the east side of Memorial Stadium. The old horseshoe. And, yeah, the horseshoe. There you go. Uh, sorry. And then uh, you could see through it, and there's an LED board that rotates through all of the players um, that have their names up on the uh, on the north side of Memorial Stadium. And wouldn't you know whose name was popped up right when Josh snapped the picture? And that was, of course, Mr. Trev Alberts. So <laughs> it looked like it was the Trev Alberts building kind of for a second, but it just, I think it rotated through. I assume his name didn't stay up there the whole time. You know, I was going to say it kind of is the Trev Alberts building, but it's more the Bill Moose building than it is the Trev yeah. Alberts building. Trev, he did help keep that thing alive through some difficult times. But so what do you think? Like Trev Alberts. <laughs> And Josh did use use a use like the traitor word in in uh, in posting on he social likes media. About the bear. Yeah. So is it okay for Nebraska to have Trev Albert's name adorning not only the stadium but now the new Osborne Legacy Complex in all of the uh, LED lighting that uh, that he saw? <laughs> of course it is. People are insane. They're, remember when he left and people were like, "We well, got to take his name off the off the thing." I'm like, you, "Calm down." You know, it's, it's going to be okay. He's a, he's a great, he was a great Husker football player before he was a really good athletic director and then did indeed leave for, for a different job, which does indeed happen sometimes. We're so nice. We're so nice here in Nebraska. We just say everything's cool. You know, you left and, and you left us out, out in the dark and hung us out to dry and, and, but it's fine. We're going to leave your name, you know, on the stadium and, and we'll even put it in the new building and led lights. Like we've, we'll forgive and forget here in Nebraska because we're just such nice people. I wish, I wish your take would have been like, no, take it down. Like it's okay to be in the stadium because that's history, but, but in the new building, it, it shouldn't be there. Um, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but I want somebody to, to, I want somebody to say that and, and, well, and stick. Maybe they, it. maybe they come up with an algorithm to mix his name in there less or something. Do they like spell that. it wrong maybe or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, That's a good idea. Um, elsewhere. Um, so this is one of the things that makes our show now that we are in the middle of nothing going on in sports and we're waiting for media days to start. Uh, Matt rule tweeted a picture on Tuesday morning. Um, and does so that. that is going to be a discussion point for at least three minutes on this show. Yeah, we could just end the show right now, but we want to talk about Matt rule on a Disney cruise and he's wearing, um, he's wearing what, like it was this, is, is he, is he in character, um, from a Disney movie? Um, uh, he's got two young, two young daughters, so he's probably entertaining them, but regardless, he's in, he's in a crown, some type of a king from a Disney movie, probably eating a Disney themed meal uh, with Disney music in the background and shaking the hands of Disney characters dressed in full uniform as they as they come by and entertain everyone. Yeah, the only thing that was missing was like Mickey Mouse or Cinderella or something like that. Just photobomb in the picture. Um, it's a great picture. It will definitely be used as a meme um, from here throughout the history of time. He's really leaned into the double finger point by the way, mm -hmm. um, oh. yeah, wasn't there something didn't you have something to do with that? So I, I, I don't know for sure. I'll have to ask him, but you know, I, when we took a picture together at media days last year mm -hmm. and I was, we talked about, he was doing the single finger point and mm -hmm. I did the, and, and we briefly talked about, I was like, how do you, you know, why, where'd you come up with this? What are you doing? And he made a joke about how it covered up, covers up his fat or something like that. And I'm like, Oh, that's <laughs> funny. And I did the double finger point. And people were like, what's the double finger point? I'm like, I don't know. I just pointed with two fingers. And from there on out, every every picture was double finger point for Matt Rule. Yeah, he so does it know. with recruits, he, 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 with parents, what, whatever, former players. And now on the on – the, I don't even know who he's pointing at in, this, on a boat. in, the, in the photo. <laughs> Maybe it was Cinderella over there. It, it could have been. So this is good. I think this is really good to somehow try to make a serious conversation out of this. I think it's really good that he's able to get just a little bit of time away before um, you know everything hits the fan next week. Um, it's 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 fast and furious when when he goes to Indy and 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 then comes back to Lincoln on the twenty the twenty fifth. They'll have about five days before the first practice, even less than that, before the players start to come in for, for camp. So, you know, coaches, uh, administrators, they all need media, media people, 
Um, this is why you will not see me with this background for the remainder of this week. It will be, it will be, uh, hopefully a pool or a beach, um, from my, my, my positioning. We all need a little bit of time, including Matt rule. So good for him that, that he and Julie and the kids got to go on a, on a cruise and hang out with Disney princesses. Yeah. Love it. And, uh, he cut the beard off as well. If we continue to kind of, uh, Zapruder this, uh, this picture, he, no, no. I mean, he's down to the stubble. It was, there was a little bit. Yeah. He, he, so he cut the whole beard off in the, in the spring, I believe it was maybe, maybe, uh, around signing day, uh, before the spring. And it was, a, it was a very different look and, and I don't think he loved it because he said it's not going to stay for long. Remember the Iowa game last year when he did, he went through warmups and he had a Fu Manchu. Um, and then during the game, he just had a mustache and then <laughs> I think after the he like shaved what? his facial hair what? in between warmups in the game. I swear to God, it was because people noticed that he had you know the mustache and you know kind of down to here with the goatee, um, but no no chin before the game. And then he coaches in the game and he he didn't have that. I think he just had a mustache at that point. It was very it was very confusing. So he likes to mess around with his facial hair. We've learned. I was not aware of this, but this sounds like a great topic of discussion for for uh, Big Ten Media Days uh-huh. um, with Matt Rule. I think it's gonna the question will need to be asked about that. So, all that I know. right, we've we've done enough damage. Um, yeah, let's get out of here um, yeah. on this Wednesday. We'll be back with one more episode this week before we get into next week's uh, shows, which should focus focus on some actual football talk as uh, teams get down and dirty in Indianapolis. Uh, before we leave. We'll tell you one more time that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and it's now available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app.